Why does connecting two half cells in a galvanic cell give rise to an electrical potential difference or voltage? What is it about the reactive components, the reactants and the products that gives rise to this electrical energy? To begin exploring this question and exploring the differences between different types of electrode materials in galvanic cells, I wanted to compare two galvanic cells, one we've seen before and one we haven't. So on the left, I have the copper-silver galvanic cell that we've seen before. And we noted previously that electrons flow spontaneously from the copper side to the silver side. And spontaneously, copper is oxidized to copper 2, and silver 1 is reduced to silver metal. And so electrons flow spontaneously from left to right. But if you swap out the silver with another metal, this isn't necessarily what happens. So say, for example, we wanted to achieve the same thing, but we didn't have silver because, hey, silver is kind of expensive. So we tried to use lead instead, relying on the idea that, hey, copper should, in theory, hypothetically anyway, be able to supply electrons that can reduce lead to to lead metal. So we set up a galvanic cell with a lead to nitrate solution and lead metal on one side, the side we want to be the cathode, and we set up our typical copper, copper two half cell on the left, and we want that to be the anode, and we're trying to get electrons to flow from left to right like this. And so we throw in a salt bridge, we connect the two half cells together, we go to measure the voltage, and the voltage comes out negative. Whoops indicating that, in fact, electrons are not flowing from right to left, from left to right spontaneously, but from right to left. Electrons are flowing this way. Whoops. As it turns out here, what nature wants to do, what is thermodynamically favorable, which hints at where we're going in this section in the next few, is the reduction of copper two to copper metal by lead and lead's oxidation to lead two plus. So when we connect these two half cells together, electrons want to flow from the lead electrode to the copper electrode, making the lead side the anode and the copper side the cathode. And what happens in a particular situation all depends on the identities of these metals and in certain cases, as we'll see, on the concentrations of the aqueous species, copper 2 plus and lead 2 plus in this case. Both of these variables profoundly influence which direction electrons flow and the specific voltage that's achieved across the galvanic cell. We're going to explore that in this section. So we just saw that silver plus is capable of oxidizing copper but lead 2 plus is not. Why is this? Well, in a sense, we can think about it in terms of the oxidizing power of silver plus and lead 2 plus. Silver plus has sufficient oxidizing power to oxidize copper to copper 2 plus, but lead 2 plus does not. And rather than getting into the structural reasons why this is the case, we can begin thinking about things like electronegativity and go down a pretty deep rabbit hole. For the time being, we just want to quantify this. And one way to quantify it is to get some kind of a standard measure of the electrical potential of a half cell. And before we dig into that, let's define what we mean by electrical potential. Electrical potential is a measure of the energy that accompanies a transfer of charge. So if we imagine, for example, that we are transferring one coulomb of charge using an energy of one joule, the potential difference we've created in transferring that charge is equal to one volt. So the volt is defined as one joule divided by one coulomb or one joule per coulomb. This means that we can think of voltage, which we often represent in this unit with the letter E, as an energy. And I'm going to represent this energy with the letter G, for reasons that will become clear later, divided by a charge Q. And this very simple looking equation is going to have profound implications a little bit later in this unit. 
Now, electrical potential for a half cell in isolation doesn't really have any physical meaning, since if we think about a typical galvanic cell here, we can't just send electrons into oblivion. So the potential of a copper half cell kind of has no meaning in and of itself. What we're really interested in here is in the potential difference between the copper half cell and the silver half cell. And that potential difference is the voltage that we actually measure. So potential difference or voltage is the measurable quantity here. We represent that with the letter E, just as we did above. And this is what provides the driving force for galvanic cells. The spontaneous redox reaction is associated with an electrical potential difference, and that is the voltage that we measure across the galvanic cell. Now, this will always be in a situation of non-equilibrium. When the two half cells are in equilibrium, such that electrons, there is no net flow of electrons from the left to the right or the right to the left, well, in that case, the electrical potentials of the half cells are equal, and so the potential difference is equal to zero. We'll return to this point later as well. So this is just some foundational ideas that are going to get us thinking about cell potential. The potential difference associated with a galvanic cell is something that we're going to call the cell potential. And we're very interested in being able to calculate this, work with this, think about this conceptually, and think about and, and work with the variables that cell potential depends on in galvanic cells. So how do we think about measuring electrical potential? Well, the potential of a half reaction can only be measured relative to other half reactions, right? All I can do is take a half cell and hook it up to some other half cell and then measure the potential difference between those two half cells. So I can think about the cathode, where reduction is taking place, as having its own potential, and the anode, where oxidation is taking place, as having its own potential, and the potential difference for the galvanic cell is the potential of the cathode minus the potential of the anode. Now, this potential difference depends on the concentrations of aqueous species in the galvanic cell, as well as the temperature and some other experimental variables. And so we define the standard state for a galvanic cell as one in which all the aqueous components have a concentration of one mole per liter, any gases involved, and yes, gases can be involved in galvanic cells, have a pressure of one atmosphere or one bar, kind of depending on who you ask. The bigger conceptual idea behind the standard state is that in a galvanic cell at standard state, the reaction quotient, and yes, this is the reaction quotient from our earlier discussions of equilibrium, is equal to one. And the standard state conditions of one mole per liter, one bar, one atmosphere, etc., make sure that this is the case. For an electrochemical cell at standard state, the so-called standard cell potential, which is this quantity here on the left, and it's that little circle that really tells us this is a standard situation, is equal to the standard potential of the cathode minus the standard potential of the anode. And those standard potentials are measured in a very particular way that we'll talk about in the very near future. The key thing to keep in mind for any old galvanic cell is that the standard cell potential involves both half cells at standard states, such that the overall reaction quotient for the spontaneous redox reaction is equal to one. So graphically, we might think about this like the following. Think about potential as a vertical scale. The reason electrons flow from one half cell in a galvanic cell to the other is that the cathode is at a higher potential than the anode. And this has the effect of allowing charge to kind of flow downhill. Now, because of the way potential is defined, this flow of charge is actually a flow of positive charge from the cathode to the anode. Remember, electrons actually flow in the opposite direction from the anode to the cathode. And so equivalently though, we can think about this as positive charge flowing from the cathode to the anode. And I like thinking in this way because it shows that charge is flowing downhill in a sense. Potential in an electrical context acts just like gravitational potential energy. When I hold a ball up here and drop it, 
it will fall spontaneously. Likewise, charge will flow spontaneously from a half cell that is at high potential, the cathode, to a half cell at low potential, the anode. And how we measure and define the standard cathode and anode potentials ensures that this will always be the case, that E cell will always come out to a positive value because the cathode's potential will always be greater or higher than the anode's potential.